Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be richly multiplied unto each one of us this morning hour. It's a privilege to be here this morning with you, a privilege to be gathered around God's Word. Truly, it's my prayer that together with you this morning that our hearts would be warmed and encouraged, uplifted and strengthened in faith through the word that we will look into. Last night, Pastor Jason gave us a a definition or some thoughts on Thanksgiving, and I just wanted to reiterate maybe a, a few of those words. That Thanksgiving is something that uh, it can't really be generated. It has to be revealed in my thinking. The idea is that for true thankfulness, there's this thought of uh, indebtedness. And maybe as an example, we can think of it this way. When we think about one of the things that we're most thankful for, and that is the freedoms that we enjoy and that we're exercising this morning, this freedom of religion, and those that have went before us and those that have secured that freedom for us, we're, we are thankful. And we're, we owe, because we owe a, a deep debt of gratitude to those that have given us that freedom. And we know that it has been from nothing that we have done ourselves. It's something that somebody else has given to us. And that's the true spirit of thankfulness. So it's something that's outside of ourselves. It's something that it has to be open to us. Uh, so if we are closed and think we are achieving on our own and, and able to do all things that we need, we are not thankful people. But then if we look at this in a spiritual aspect, and that is one of the elements of why we gather and why we pray, why we speak to our Heavenly Father is that we may thank Him. And we often ask that He would give us thankful hearts. And truly, from a spiritual perspective, we cannot be thankful enough unless God reveals His goodness to us. So this thankfulness has to be opened to us, that we in and of ourselves have been not able to achieve, and that we owe this great debt that cannot be paid, and it's something that has to be accomplished for us that's outside of our ability to do, and that's what uh, Jesus Christ did on our behalf at the behests of his Father who sent him to earth, and he was obedient unto death. And so as we look into his word, and it's open to us, our hearts rejoice. And so that's our prayer this morning as we look into his word, that our hearts would overflow with thankfulness and thanksgiving. And I've chosen a text that has this very element in it. It's the prayers of Hannah found in the book of Samuel. It would be the first book of Samuel. We would read from... Verse 8 of the first chapter of 1 Samuel, and we would read a lengthy portion all the way to uh, the second chapter of 1 Samuel, the third verse. As you find that place, we're not reading, we could even read more there, but uh, we'll jump in after we're introduced to those that are around Hannah. And if you remember from Sunday school that Hannah was the mother of Samuel who would become a a great prophet uh, of his day. And Hannah's husband was named Elkina, and we're told about his lineage, that he was a Levite from the mountain country of Ephraim. And we're also told that he had another wife, Penina, and that there was this, I guess we could say, a love triangle between the three of them. Elkanah had these two wives, Hannah and Penina, and Penina had children, and Hannah had no children. But Elkanah preferred Hannah, and so then that provoked Penina to je- jealousy, and then uh, Penina derided Hannah on the account of her being barren 
or even as we heard in the words of the psalmist, desolate. That's another word there, is desolate. And so then we come into this after we're introduced to these, these people, and we read then uh, about Elkanah's response to Hannah uh, wanting a child, beginning again at, at verse 8 of chapter 1 in 1 Samuel. Then said Elkanah to her husband, her husband to her, Hannah, Why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but wilt give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman, the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worship and before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned. And then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry, thou, <clears throat> tarry until thou hast weaned him, only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. <clears throat> and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young and they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as the, thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Amen. These are thy holy words, Holy Father. Sanctify us through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. As I mentioned, Elkanah was a Levite. And prior to where we read, we are told that he went up year by year to Shiloh, as would be the custom of the Levites to make an offering, a burnt offering, a peace offering, and uh, the offerings 
to commemorate the Passover. And we see that they were obedient and that uh, his wives came with him. But it seems that Penina took this opportunity. Perhaps this was the only time of the year that they were uh, near each other or around each other as when they were, would go up to Shiloh. And that it says that um, she provoked her. In the seventh verse, provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. And it also refers to her as an adversary or an enemy. And it's odd to think that these two women would have uh, despised each other this much. But we see that's how it was. That Hannah then took these words to heart and, and began to be very sorrowful. And she was full of grief and she despaired. And that is the office of the adversary. And that's what Peter writes also about the adversary. He goes about, he's the devil. He goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that is that they would devour this trust and this faith that we have. They would make our faith shipwreck. And that is the goal of the enemy, our adversary, is to shut up our faith and to close it off. And here, then this is where Hannah began to despair this message that she had not been blessed with children. And she began to take this very deeply and that the Lord had turned on her and she was hurt. So much so that she wouldn't even eat, we're told. And her husband, because he loved her and it says that he gave her a double portion when they came up to worship for the feasts, he wanted to comfort her, but we see, as husbands do at times, they don't understand their wives. Here we see that Elkanah certainly didn't understand the desire of Hannah's heart, and that is that he made this comment, that he said, Why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? And we see that Hannah didn't answer. And if she would have, she would have said no, ten times no. And as husbands, we've learned this truth somewhat maybe the hard way. That when we have seen our first child born with our wives, we see that look that they have for their child. And we understand that that is a place that is sacred and, and separate from what a husband can provide. It's a blessed thing, that bond between a mother and a child, that love that's there. So no, Elkanah, you cannot replace. You are not better to me than ten sons. Perhaps to be able to provide for me from a physical standpoint, yes. You can provide all my physical needs, but the fulfillment of having a child that came from my womb is something that you cannot cover for. And so that's then, that's, we're not given that response, but that, that would be her response. And so it says that Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And we see she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She is grieved. And this place, Shiloh, if you remember, it's the, was the house of the Lord or the, the where the temple was or the tabernacle that when Joseph went into the promised land, that's where he set up the temple. And so it's the spiritual center of Israel at this time. And that was before then, or the, then we, the two kingdoms were divided. And we have the northern kingdom of Israel where Shiloh was the center. And at the time of David, after him, then we have the southern kingdom of Judah, and we know that the capital or the, the spiritual center of Judah was Jerusalem. So Shiloh was equivalent 
at this time to Jerusalem. It was their center of worship. And so this is where they came year by year. And Hannah went obediently, or by revelation, she knew this was the place where she should pour out her heart before the Lord. And it's exactly right. In prayer, before the Lord, we pour out the deepest, darkest concerns of our heart. Whether they be right or not, the Lord wants us to bring our burdens to him. And we could say, we could belittle Hannah here, saying that not having a son is a small thing compared to some of the other things that could happen to you. But nonetheless, this issue was grieving her, and she was very bitter about it. And so she brought it to the Lord. And he is willing to hear our prayers. And we don't know what prayer he will hear and how he will move. But we see that at this particular time when Hannah came up on this, this year when she came up, we're not told of her prayer every year when she came up, but this particular prayer, it says that she vowed a vow. <clears throat> in the 11th verse, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. This is quite a promise, quite a vow. It, it seems remarkable in that she is the very thing that she's praying for, she is vowing to give up. And so the Lord is moving in her heart. And that's what happens when we pray. When we draw near to the Lord, he wants to reveal his will to us. It's not so much that we petition him to change his mind, but in those petitions and in that dialogue that the Lord opens up himself to us. And I believe that's what's taking place here. That the Lord had not answered the prayer prior to this, but now Hannah's praying according to God's will. And why is it God's will? If we would read all the books of Sam or the chapters of Samuel here, and it's very interesting read, so I encourage you to do that. But we see that there is a bigger, much greater plan than going on here. There's a bigger problem than just Hannah's problem of barrenness. That Eli had authorized his sons to be in the temple, and they, and they were extremely wicked men. They were polluting the sacrifices and all the things that were of God. So God was working behind the scenes to fulfill his own promise that the scepter and the lawgiver would not depart from Shiloh until he comes. That is, Jesus Christ would come and fulfill all. His promise is that he would raise up those from amongst us that would preach and teach the truth. And so God is working in the background to bring about this work, much like he did at the time of Esther. And how that beautiful story, how Esther became queen, but it wasn't just for her own glory. It was for the glory of God that he would save his people Israel. In fact, when we look at what uh, Mordecai had to say there, he, he, he said that this is, perhaps this has happened for such a time as this, but he also had the revelation that God would work. Whether you were obedient, Esther, or not, God is going to work, but it's for your glory and enjoyment and edification that you would be part of God's plan, that you would be obedient for such a time as this. Here, Hannah also becoming part of God's plan because she is obedient. She came, poured out her heart, and now her prayer and God's will are aligned, and he answers that prayer. So that's why we can't look at a text like this and begin to interpret it as a prosperity doctrine. 
It would be easy to write a book about how we should follow the steps here of Hannah. We should name it and claim it that if the only reason that God doesn't answer our prayers is because we don't go up often enough or we don't pray long enough or we don't have faith or we don't have this or that. James cuts right to the chase. He says, you receive not because you ask amiss. You miss the mark in your prayers, that your prayers are selfish, in other words. And even our best intentioned prayers often are selfish, or they can start out that way. And that's not such a bad thing. As when we come before God, he does open our hearts. And our prayers tend to go from being self-centered, and then they go out. That's another beauty of prayer. But we cannot take that here. It's God's will, and that's why we pray that his will would be done, regardless of how we would pray or what we would expect. So it's not out of anything that Hannah has done herself here other than be obedient to what she has been taught. That is to come into the house of the Lord and pour out her heart. And we don't know what prayers will be answered. I was thinking even this morning about my own life. My daughter had uh, got leukemia when she was two, two and a half. And there were many hundreds of prayers offered up. And God answered that prayer. And we're so thankful that my daughter is vibrant and healthy today. But we also were there in the hospital with many other others where God was not answering those prayers in the way that we would have liked to have seen, or the parents and others, friends, would have liked to have seen, that there were children that were suffering greatly and were not being cured or healed. So we don't know. And it sure leaves you with a sense of, uh, in some ways, even a sense of guilt, because you know that you do not deserve an answer to your prayer. You don't feel worthy of, of, of that. But we are even going back to that idea of being indebted. We are in, greatly indebted that God did answer our prayers. So we don't know what ans- uh, prayers he will answer, but he will answer according to his will and his, his time and his need. And so with this prayer of Hannah, where she uses this term, handmaid, which means to be uh, essentially a woman servant. That that's how she sees herself before the Lord. She is a willing servant to do, and she is humble, humbleness of heart. That's what she has. She's willing to do whatever it is if the Lord would hear her prayer. And she, she vowed then to give this child back. And you think that this uh, Penina had ridiculed her for not having children that this would be the very thing that she would want to cling to. But God had softened her heart and had worked in her heart that she would be willing to give back this gift so that she wouldn't be able to tell Penina, look, here is the physical evidence that God has indeed blessed me. She was willing to give that back. And it wasn't just idle words that she vowed. It wasn't some bargain like we often do. We make bargains. But this wasn't that kind of a prayer. And then she vowed also that he would be a Nazarite. And the Sunday school children probably know better than than us adults remember what a a Nazarite vow is. If we look back at Samsung and, and also John the Baptist, Essentially, that they, their hair would not be cut and that they would drink no wine and would not have any contact with anything that would make them unclean, such as touching dead things. 
those were the three elements of a Nazarite vow. And so a Nazarite vow means to be set apart or consecrated so that Hannah was willing to give up this child so that he would serve and be God's, that he, she would surrender him to God. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. <clears throat> now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. That's quite an accusation. And we know that it's, it's an accusation that's, that's found in other places. We know on, the, on Pentecost that the, uh, those there that prophesied and, and spoke were accused of being drunk at that time as well. But Eli, as a, a sign of the times, you might say, and the depravity that was going on inside the temple, this was his conclusion because... I'm assuming from the way it's written that this was happening. This wasn't the first time that he, what he thought he saw was happening and had indeed had happened. And so he accuses Hannah of being drunk. But she defends herself and says, no, I'm very sorrowful. In my lips, I'm so deep in despair and my heart is so heavy that I'm not able to even get out words. Her lips just moved. And that's how troubled she was. And we are told, even as we see when we'll contrast her later prayer, that in Matthew, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so here she was so in despair that she didn't have the abundance in her heart to speak out. She was so heavy in spirit and troubled. It says, Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the women went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. So this is the office of a priest. And this is what a priest has been called to do, a judge or a priest. And that is to encourage the people that are heavy and weighed down and sorrowful. That Eli, once he understood just how heavy her heart was, he told her to go in peace. That the, the peace would be restored to her. Her adversary had taken away her peace. But the office of the priest is to restore that peace and to give of that peace. And the encouragement is to go in peace and to be free. And he said also that the Lord would hear thy petition. And we see that there is a change in her countenance, that she then took this, these words of Eli, the, the priest, to heart. And she went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. That she believed the words of Eli. This encouragement that Eli had given her, she was able to lay hold of that encouragement that God had heard her prayer and would act and move. And so she went. To go in peace means to go in faith to go forward now out of the temple and live and believe that what you have heard will be done. The promise will be fulfilled. And so she got up from there and went. 
And they rose up early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. The Lord never forgets. The Lord had heard that prayer, and Eli had testified that the Lord had heard that prayer. And the Lord visited him when they were intimate there, and she conceived and bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked of him of the Lord. As in the Old Testament, the names were according to what had taken place. So his name means, I have asked him of the Lord. Samuel. Then we will go quickly over some of these verses here until we get further down. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned. Then I will bring him, and he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry unto thou, thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And she slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as, a, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. So long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord." And he worshiped the Lord there. So we see that he was kept until he was weaned in the house of Hannah, and she didn't go up until she was able to make good on the offering that she had, or the vow that she had vowed. And so Samuel would have been somewhere around four years old when she took him up. And we see also that. That she took, you would think that, this comes to me here, you would think as you would take your son up to the service of the Lord that that would be enough of an offering. But we see here that they brought a full offering in addition to Samuel. That Samuel was the Lord's, and it was not theirs to essentially give, but they brought up the Passover offering in addition to Samuel. And they worshiped there, and they presented the offering, and then they presented Samuel to Eli. And then there's this portion also that. Eli was also encouraged. Eli the priest, the one to give encouragement, the priest also needs encouragement. He needs the revelation of the word. He needs to see and have the word opened on to him. The priest as well as those that come in. And here we see Eli uplifted and encouraged also by the fulfillment of the promise and the words that he had spoken to Hannah, that the Lord was still working through him and that the word was not void. And it says, and he worshiped the Lord there, meaning Eli. Not only did Elkanah and Hannah worship but Eli also worshiped, and he glorified God. 
And then we're told that Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. So here we see a complete change from one prayer to the other. If we would contrast these two prayers, a prayer petition, a, a, a asking prayer, a, a desire, the first prayer, and heaviness of heart. Here, a prayer of thanksgiving for what God had done, that he had been merciful and he had been gracious unto Hannah and had heard her prayer even though she was willing to give him back and not have a child. She spoke out loudly. And so now her heart's overflowing with abundance. My heart rejoices in the Lord. That there is no other place outside of the Lord where I can find this comfort. My horn or my strength is exalted, that I'm brought up and I'm made strong in the Lord. In the Lord. Hannah has learned something through this trial, through this thing that she's went through of being barren for a time, to wait on the Lord. And here we see her gratitude for what he has done. She rejoices in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. My mouth is opened. I am able to glorify God as I should. As I see what I have been able to accomplish versus what he has been able to do. I rejoice in what he has done, what he has given. I see that compared to my own despair and, what, and, and to what I was able to achieve. I was not able to bring forth life. God is able to bring forth life. I was desolate. Only God can remove that desolation in the Lord. And then we see, because I rejoice in thy salvation. And if we read this too quickly, this word salvation doesn't quite jump off the page maybe as it should. It seems like we were talking about a son, Samuel, and the desire to have a son. But it says she's rejoicing because of her salvation. That's remarkable. Something much deeper than an answer to a prayer of being barren of a child. Salvation. The free gift of Jesus Christ through his son. That's salvation. Peace, righteousness, and joy. That's what he brings. That's what he gives. Salvation. Comes through life, new life. And maybe we can see then a little bit closer, bring ourselves a little bit closer to Hannah here. When we look upon the barrenness of Hannah and her desire to have a children and to generate life, she was not able to do it on her, of herself. We also have not been able to generate life of ourselves. Our own works have pr produced 
desolation and barrenness. But there's one coming after Samuel. Samuel was a priest for a time in the temple. He was lent unto the Lord for the days of his life. But there is another coming, and who has come? Jesus Christ. He went into the temple once for all. He is this new creature. He is this new life, this new man that God has given to each one of us by his spirit. He's given it by revelation through his word. He's opened the need for us. He's shown us that we have not been able to save ourselves. Salvation comes from outside of us. He puts his spirit in us and this new man comes forth and life comes forth. Spiritual life, this new man who is acceptable to God and is righteous before God. And that's who we have living in us today. We have not been able to produce this new life. But by prayer and by seeking, he has answered that prayer. The Lord himself prayed for us. And he was obedient unto death. He fulfilled that so that we might be saved, that we might have new life. And so Hannah, she sees here beyond Samuel in her thanksgiving, much as the other writers, the prophetic writers, Isaiah, the psalmist, that she sees beyond Samuel and sees into the face of Jesus Christ. And that comes by revelation. And that's the new man that's been born in each one of us, and it's come by revelation. And we also know with Hannah that we have not been able to produce this new life. And so today with Hannah, we can rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord, for he is good and right. He has provided all things. He has done this great work so that we might live, so that we can then, along with Hannah, with enlarged mouths and hearts, praise him for all that he has done and the salvation that he has provided through his word and through his son that is now, this morning, living in each one of us. Believe it. That new man is alive in each one of us. It's hard for this human mind to grasp that there is perfection in each one of us. But when we turn to the Word, we see that it's so. And He reveals it to us. So even this morning, we can, with great confidence, sit and stand and praise God with a true heart and a true spirit and know with a surety here as Hannah rejoiced that she rejoices in her salvation, that it is sure, that it is pure, and it is good. And and then we could conclude with this thought that there is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. He is everything. He is our all in all. He's unmovable. He's unshakable. His promises are like this rock. 
They are good forever. And we can also be sure that his word will continue on. Even as this desperate time in which Samuel came into and ministered and was was obedient, sometimes we look around us and we begin to despair. But his promise is that he will never leave us or forsake us. So let us continually look to his word and ask for his revelation and be encouraged through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue by singing song 462, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
Today we celebrate what we have just sung. We crown him the Lord of all. This is Christ the King Sunday. And on this weekend when we give thanks, we give thanks for many things that we have heard, but above all, for our King, our Lord Jesus Christ. As a boy, I remember the Bible stories as they were read to me by my parents. My mother in particular was good at reading to us children, Sunday school teachers and the pastors that I listened to as a young boy. And this morning as I was listening once again to a familiar story from the Old Testament, my heart rejoiced. And uh, almost to my 64th birthday, I pray that God would let me keep hearing these stories until I see my Lord face to face. Christ the King Sunday. What kind of a king is he? It is a good question. What kind of a king do we have? If we were to turn a few more pages from the text that we have been meditating on already this morning, we would find this little boy who was brought to the temple has grown to be a man. The children of Israel have become restless, disenchanted, unhappy with the way things are. They're always a picture of the Christian church to me when I think of the children of Israel. They just are. They're a picture of me as an individual and to us as the children of God today. And they began to uh, look around them and see how others were faring, and they became jealous of them, and they desired a king. They had a theocracy before that, that was God ruled, and they followed his teachings, his judgments, the revelation, as we heard this morning, of him. But that became a little bit old to them, and so they desired a king, and Samuel spoke to the Lord about what the people had asked him. They wanted a king, and so the Lord said, give them one. But listen to the attributes of the kings that would serve them. This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself for his chariots and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. He's going to raise an army of your sons. He will appoint over him captains over thousands, captains over fifties. Set them to ear his ground, to reap his harvest, to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And it just goes on and on. The king that they wanted and the kings that have ruled this earth are so different than Christ the King. I want to read from the Gospel of John this morning a few verses. From the 18th chapter, I'm going to begin at verse 33. John 18, beginning at verse 33, and we will read through 38. In the name of our King, Jesus Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into this world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. 
Everyone that is of truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Amen. I guess I could just say it again. What kind of a king is this? That Pilate has now returned to the judgment hall, called on him, brought him into his presence, and really Pilate was forced to do so. Pilate didn't want anything to do with this. He saw it plain as could be. So did his wife. His wife, in fact, warned him, don't have anything to do with this man. This problem, this argument, this fight... Turn back to the Gospel of Luke and the other, one of the other records of this very event that we've read about here in, in the 23rd chapter. We get a little bit of a detail that John leaves out, but I think it's important as we remember these things this morning as we consider Christ our King. 23rd chapter of Luke, we read... The whole multitude of them arose and led them unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. These are the enemies of Christ who have brought him to Pilate because they couldn't legally do away with him because they were under the Roman rule. But so devious and dark are their hearts that they will lie outright. They will hire false witnesses. The three charges that they brought to Pilate and now Pilate returns into the judgment hall and brings Jesus and starts to question him are completely false. You know that, I know that, we have the record. What did he say when people questioned him? Should we give tribute to Caesar? Show me a coin. Whose image do you see? Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. Plain and simple, pay tribute to Caesar. They said he teaches that we shouldn't. That's an absolute lie. Is he a rebel? Does he claim to be the king of the nation? That is the natural, earthly, still today recognized nation of Israel. Is that his claim? No. When Pilate begins to question him, Jesus answered, he gives the answer. I don't have to give the answer. You don't have to wonder about the answer. We have the record. Art thou the king of the Jews? First Jesus asks him, is this a question of your own or did somebody else put you up to this? Well, Jesus knows. It's not a question of his own. Pilate is almost scornful proud man, Roman leader, scornful of these people. But now he has this man in front of him. And all of the baggage that goes along with Pilate's position in this world begins to weigh him down. So much that if you read in the history and the records of the Romans from you know, Josephus or others, you'll find that Pilate did not fare well after this. He didn't fare well. But all he can say is, am I a Jew? He just so wants to distance himself from this, this uh, conflict that is going on between the Jews. And that includes Jesus. He's a Jew. He came to his own. And his own received him not. Pretty clearly, they don't. He'd like to do away with the Jewish question completely. Am I a Jew? It's like, this is your problem. We have before us here the, the, the conflict, of course, that is described for us in what is the scandalon of Jesus, the scandal of Jesus. 
You know, to the Jew, he is an absolute stumbling block. They can't deal with him. Because their idea of what their king or their Messiah is like is so vastly different than what Jesus presents to them when he comes. Though it is clearly written of in the Old Testament, they still conjured up in their minds somehow, some way, a different image of their king. And to Pilate, perhaps representing the Greek half of this equation, it's just foolishness. It's just absolute foolishness. Are you a king, he asked Jesus. Who asked you about this, Jesus responds. Am I a Jew, thine own nation? The chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What have you done? <laughs> you know, he knows that he has, Jesus has irritated these people at least. You've stirred up the mob, and not just the mob, but the leadership of this nation that I have to rule over. Reluctantly, this backwater part of the Roman Empire, the least of all places anyone would want to be appointed to serve in, either in leadership or in the army. Here they are, these rebellious people, and they brought you to me. What have you done? And then Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. He's been accused of being a rebel. False charges is true. But even Pilate can see the hypocrisy of the accusations. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. I think Pilate begins to understand, perhaps at least to a certain degree, the words of our Lord, that this is truly a conflict between him and his own people. He doesn't say my servants would fight against Rome, as the accusation was. He's a rebellious person. But his kingdom is not from this world. It's very interesting how Pilate would, as I said, recognize the conflict. In the 19th chapter, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And then you drop down to verse 21, and they said, that is the chief priests of the Jews, to Pilate. Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. But Pilate answered. What I have written, I have written. The conflict raged. But Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So, what kind of a king is he? You who are a Christian this morning, who claim him to be your king. Do you know the difference between an earthly king and this king that we are talking about, reading about, worshiping? celebrating on this day of Christ the King Sunday. Do you know what he's like? God will answer for us in words that are well penned by one of his servants if we turn to the letter that Paul wrote to the people in Colossae. Colossians chapter 1. Jesus' authority is like no other authority on earth. No earthly king has ever held this kind of authority. And interestingly, wonderfully, as we have talked and heard last night and this morning already, the reason why we have gratitude and thanksgiving is because we recognize the great gift we have received. And that is that we have been made members of a kingdom, of a king that is described in the first chapter of Colossians. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Moved us into his son's kingdom. He who is our king. In whom we have redemption. Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In this kingdom, that is the kingdom of Christ that Paul is writing about here, we live under our heavenly king 
who is like no other king. And he goes on to say for us here in the 15th and following verses who he is. He describes him. If we ask what kind of a king do we serve, here it's answered. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. By him all things were created that are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Earthly kings set up because there is a population of people that have accepted them as such and perhaps passed down from generation to generation from one father to his son to his grandson. But they're a king because there's a population. This king made the population. This king drew you into his kingdom by his grace, a kingdom that he has created. He's the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in all things he might have preeminence. And yet he rules with grace and compassion. Love and humility. He rules like no other king. And it's expressed in these next two verses. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So this rebel, falsely accused rebel, is now here described. And now we must turn to the next verse and understand why. When Paul began to preach this, the accusation against Paul was that he's turned the world upside down. I love that statement. I've, I've grown to appreciate it so much when we turn to the word Consider the things of God in Christ as he reconciles the world to himself, when he turns things upside right. Because the enemies of Christ consider him a rebel. Paul makes it clear who's the rebel. You are the rebel. You are. You that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And we could continue to read that beautiful chapter, but the simple message is this. Christ is not the rebel. You are the rebel. And instead of casting you out of the kingdom or dealing with your rebellion as a king would, as he would suppress a rebellion... He dies for the rebels. Willingly pays the debt of the rebel. On the cross, we see Christ ruling. That's how your king is. That's who your king is. We're the rebels. If you don't think you're rebellious, all you have to do is just look at the simple natural makeup of we who are American citizens today, in a, maybe in a simplistic way. We left Europe, most of us. Our ancestors came from Europe the early days, and we celebrated it just on Thursday and Thanksgiving for the bounty of the harvest, and we should do so. But when you think of why they left Europe and why they eventually rebelled against their king from Europe, it was because taxation without representation, and we're so proud of the Boston Tea Party. And from there, it begins to build. And the American spirit and the individualism that we are so proud of continues to plague us when it comes to these things. We don't like authority. By nature, we are rebellious. We don't even know what it's like to live under a king, a supreme authority. We criticize our leaders. We can't wait to vote them out. We pray that our side wins in each election. This is our nature. We have never known what it is like to live under a supreme ruler. 
And our rebellion is not unlike a rebellion that is depicted when this king hung on his throne between two malefactors. When he surveyed, surveyed, is it the songwriter says, when he surveyed his kingdom from a cross, when he looked out at you from a cross, when he spoke these words to you as he mediated between you and the heavenly father and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And there were two malefactors, one on either side. And the sign over his cross was there for them to read as well. But there were two reactions, and I can't help but think about them a little bit this morning as we consider and close this morning's service with the question, what is your king like? Who is he? We being the rebels. Again, in Luke's record, chapter 23, you can read how it goes. And eventually we get to the place where Jesus is hanging on his cross and two malefactors, that is two rebels on either side, And the first one speaks to him. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. Keeping in mind, this is the last moments of this man's life. He had lived his life in open rebellion and it cost him, it's going to cost him his very life. The wages of what he did was going to be sin. I mean, excuse me, death. Like ours, the wages of sin is death. But now when he finally looks on the man who is there hanging on the cross beside him, he rails on him, saying, If if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. His last desperate attempt, railing scornfully at Jesus, is, If you're really who you say you are, save us. But the other thief speaks hope for us rebels. We who are crucified with Christ. True repentance. He speaks to the other rebel as we should speak to other rebels because we being of the same makeup as them, we are able to. As I've said far too many times, for you who are so used to hearing my voice, I know I'm a sinner And I know you are as well. So one rebel speaks to the other rebel. The other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Condemnation has come upon all, for all have sinned. We're getting what we deserve. But he recognizes this king as a man unlike any other man. We indeed justly, for we receive due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. I think it was last night, was it Andy, Jason, I forgot which one was said it, but There was a moment when there was one sinner on earth. That kind of caught me for a second, and I thought, okay, I I guess I can understand. I guess I can receive that, and and today I'm thankful for that. Because he, as he hung there, the man who had done nothing wrong became sin for us. He took our sin debt, yours and mine, completely, in full. We deserved what we were receiving and are going to receive. Justly, we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man hath done nothing wrong. And in the process of all these things, as he acknowledges the reality of his situation, talks to his brother, rebukes his brother for his pride and his rejection of this wondrous king, he turns to Jesus with these touching words. Touching words. I am not always such an emotional person, but sometimes when I preach and read from the Bible, my ears, excuse me, my eyes uh, get very watery and I have to prepare myself. But this one has been one of those difficult verses to read. 
He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Remember me. That's all he could do. He had nothing else but just the request. Christ is our king. He's the king that died on the cross. Shed his blood to reconcile us to our heavenly father. And he rules his kingdom in grace, in mercy. He is the head of the body. This is Christ, our king, who has brought to us forgiveness, life, salvation by giving up his own life on the cross. He who was not a rebel died in the place of the rebellious. So today we submit ourselves to the kingship of Christ on this Christ the King Sunday. And in doing so, we are grateful, thankful, we ought to be, for his great gift, his unspeakable gift that brings us peace. And we hear the response of Jesus this morning. You will be with me in paradise. I haven't found paradise here on earth. Sometimes in my (laughs) silly dreams of finding a different life than perhaps I might experience because of stress and all the other things that might come, you know, at, at times this life gets difficult. I might think of somewhere out in the hinterlands of Montana or Wyoming or maybe Hammerfest, Norway or something. You know. no, that's not paradise. That's not paradise. It isn't Jerusalem, east, whichever direction you'd go to fly to Jerusalem today. It's the most conflict, most area of conflict I think that this world has ever seen is that Middle Eastern little sliver of land that the Christians appreciate because this whole Old Testament speaks about it. And, but once again, if there was ever a rebellious people, it was them. And he came to his own and they did not receive him. But Jesus says to those who hear his voice this morning, today you will be with me in paradise. So Christ has given us the answer to the question, what kind of a king is he? And to you rebels, I say, your rebellion is forgiven. You are now his prized possession. You are not your own. And yes, you will live forever in that kingdom. And that kingdom doesn't come with observation. Jesus made that clear. It isn't something here on this earth that you would set up and define by borders and described by uh, the number of inhabitants and its natural resources, its defense um, posture, its standing in the nations such as ours and others that claim to be superpowers. No. His kingdom consists of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We pray and thank God this morning in the name of Christ, the King. Amen. Father, we do give thanks this morning. We do give thanks for the wonder of your redeeming love, which we have found in our King, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who thought it not robbery to be equal with you, and yet he did not grasp his rights, but set them aside and was obedient to you even to the obedience of the cross that you might once again have in your possession that which was lost in the fall that is us, our hearts, our children, and our adoration. Thank you, Father. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.